Brent's a clinical psychologist who's currently professor of psychology at Brigham Young University. He's been honored recently with several awards for his scholarship and teaching, including the presidential citation from the American Psychological Association for his contribution to psychology, the Eliza R. Snow Award uh, for research on the interface of science and religion from here at BYU, and BYU's uh, top research award, the Carl G. Mazur Award. He's also received uh, the Circle of Honor Award from the Student Honor Association, and the Teacher of the Year Award from his college, and most outstanding professor by the psychology student honorary, Sai Sai Kai, Sai, is that how you say it? I was never very good at Greek, so. Brent uh, moved from Baylor University where he served as the director of clinical training for many years. and was honored there as outstanding research professor as well as Circle of Achievement Award for his uh, teaching. He's a fellow of several professional organizations including the American Psychological Association uh, and he uh, recently served as the president of the Society of Theoretical and Philosophical Psychology on the Council of the American Psychological Association and on the editorial boards of eight journals. He's co-authored uh, or authored over 200 articles and seven books. Let me just read a couple of the most recent titles to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that he's been writing about. Human Frailty, Vice, and Suffering. What uplifting topics, uh, <laughs> Brent. Uh, flourishing in the context of limits and dependency. I, you, you rescue it in the end. That's wonderful. And that's in press. And a, and a 2013 book, Taking Sides, Clashing Views on Psychological Issues. Uh, Brent is also a, a practicing uh, psychotherapist and works specifically with marital and family therapies. It's just a pleasure to have Brent as a colleague. He's made a wonderful difference here. I think I, I did, not think, I interviewed Brent as he was coming here, and I remember it as a choice experience, and uh, uh, I've been an admirer ever since. So we look forward to hearing from you after a prayer from Jeff Reber, a colleague of uh, Brent's. Thank you, uh, Jeff and, and Alan. That's most gracious introduction and prayer. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to recognize uh, a few special people to me. Um, two of my pastors are here from Center Point Church. They didn't know I was going to do this. But Scott McKinney, if you don't mind waving, and Chris Allen. Um, Scott is the lead pastor at Center Point Church, and uh, Chris is the uh, worship pastor. Um, they've told me that after this is over, Chris will be playing uh, Just As I Am, and uh, Scott will be leading an altar call, I guess. It, you said that, so I, this is just a report. Um, and my lovely wife, uh, Karen, is here, um, the light of my life. Um, the joke I tell my students is that I have a clinical diagnosis for her, uh, severely cute. So... Um, so some special people. Yeah, thank you all for coming. I should confess uh, at the outset that I've never been especially reflective about my journey as a scholar of faith, the title of this uh, presentation. In my family of origin, personal reflection was for wimps, okay? My dad was a large animal veterinarian, and you didn't help a cow to calve through reflection. Um, I'm frankly a little embarrassed, in fact, about my lack of reflection, especially since clinical psychologists are supposed to be savvy about our past. I just know that I'm not. I just, this is a confession. One of the great things about um, preparing for this presentation is that it's forced me to reflect. And I'm actually a bit startled by the many sort of narrative arcs and storylines there are in my life. I realize I ought to think about myself more often. Um, one of the clear storylines I've discovered about my life from very early to the present is the struggle between my intellectual life and my religious life, which is at least uh, one of the ways of discussing my faith journey as a scholar. Two turning points uh, stand out in this regard, one during my formative years as a, as a Missouri hillbilly. Um, 
and the other during my early graduate training as a clinical psychologist. I'd like to describe each of these experiences along with their significance to me, and then I'll draw the lessons they had and have for me. I hope they're as, as helpful or somewhat helpful to you as they have been to me. Just a bit of context for my first experience. I was reared, as we Missourians say, or Missourians say, is the way we'd say it probably, in the hills of the state, a true hillbilly town of a little over a thousand in population. In this sense, I am an authentic hillbilly. In fact, I just realized through my preparation for this paper just how true this is, even today. Uh, my Sunday best is jeans and t-shirt. Um, I relate extensively to the Duck Dynasty family as my own. <laughs> and I am a banjo picker with a singular love of everything bluegrass. Needless to say, in growing up in this small town, my hillbilly concerns did not extend to theology or even Christianity. But I was always struck by my mother's devotion to Christianity. She was not only devout, unlike my father, but she was also thoughtful about it, struggling openly with theological issues that fascinated me, despite my hillbilly environment. This hillbilly upbringing was challenged particularly when I was 12 years old, the first experience that I want to describe. I was participating at the time in a class that would qualify me for confirmation in the United Methodist Church. This was a routine class that 12-year-olds typically just endured to please their parents. My pastor, however, was clear about the document at the end of the class. Signing this document, he said, means that you believe the 25 articles of religion, the doctrine of our church. For perhaps the first time, I reflected on what I believed, and I realized I didn't have a clue. When I asked for some extra time before signing the document, my pastor and the rest of the class were horrified. But eventually, he consented. I spent the next few days contacting the pillars of our church, church officers, elders, and widely respected church members. I wanted to talk to them about the 25 articles of religion um, because I wondered what they thought about several passages that puzzled me. To my astonishment, not only were they unable to converse with me about these established doctrines of the church, most of them had never heard about the 25 articles of religion. I realize now, in retrospect, that this was a hillbilly town with only a handful of college-educated people, but the pillars of my church didn't have a clue about what the church stood for. This seemed wrong to me, and so I refused to sign the confirmation document. When my pastor announced my refusal in church, a minor community scandal ensued. I was completely taken aback. I just remember very vividly my mother encouraging me during that time. Despite her own devotion to Christianity, she was proud of my stand, proud of my not just going along with the crowd. A sympathetic buddy and I decided to explore my theological issues further by touring several other Christian congregations in town and just asking them some questions. My best remembrance of this encounter was that no one, except for a few notable pastors, could even remotely address our concerns. I especially remember the Baptists lining the church aisle as my buddy and I left this particular conversation with everybody pointing to us and saying, you are going to hell for asking such questions. Needless to say, these experiences did not encourage me about Christianity or Christians. Instead, like a lot of teenagers, I dug my heels in even further and announced my atheism. The announcement concerned my mother, but her support for my thinking critically about religion was unwavering. And my atheism continued into the first few years of college 
where my philosophy major, of all things, led me back to Christianity. I just remember thinking repeatedly as I studied philosophy that everything that made the most sense to me had already been espoused by that guy, Jesus Christ. This realization led me to read the Bible for perhaps the first time. And I saw how many of the main characters of this book, like Saul of Tarsus, were like me. I also realized that Jesus Christ had never advocated an anti-intellectual Christianity. Christianity could and should be a thinking person's religion. So allow me to note six lessons from this experience and my experiment with atheism. They are listed on, your, on the outline that I'm hoping was passed out. I'm slightly embarrassed about the large number of these lessons, but this experience I realize now was pregnant with all sorts of meanings for me. I'll also outline each, also I'll outline each lesson very briefly with the hope that we can discuss a few of them at the end. Lesson one, especially in retrospect, is that even the intellectual is ultimately relational. I believe that my critical thinking and my intellectual strength in, quote, taking on the town, as my mother put it, because that's what it seemed like, I think, to her and to me, was a direct result of my mother's support, and I believe the support of God. Yes, I believe that even God supported my atheism at the time, knowing as only he could of my need for this experience. Much like Saul of Tarsus, I may have needed to break with the they self, as Heidegger would put it, to break with the inauthenticity of following the crowd and own Christianity for myself. Similarly, lesson two, I don't think it's coincidental that courage is inside the word encouragement. I think that my mother's encouragement, especially in light of her own beliefs, was vital to cultivating the virtue of courage in me, whether intellectual courage or physical courage. I clearly felt the need for intellectual courage when I felt persecuted for my well-meaning questions in the churches my buddy and I visited. I'm currently writing a book on virtue ethics in psychology, and I believe that courage is pivotal to good scholarship especially truly Christian scholarship in this era. I'm glad to say that I see this kind of courage in my three sons, one of whom is serving our country in Afghanistan at this very moment. Lesson three, I'm not sure that Christianity can be validly practiced without its intellectual side, its amazing ideas, its radical worldview. I may be guilty of projecting here because I certainly couldn't be a Christian without this intellectual side. I do recognize that a simple faith can be almost entirely devoid of theology per se. Still, even a simple faith should not be opposed to reason in my view. There are just too many revolutionary notions in Christianity to deny our need to think about our faith. Indeed, this Jesus guy, I believe, is a radical assault on many of our, our own Western traditions. As he put it, he, as he put one such assault so elegantly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Where truth is not a set of principles, it's an embodied truth. In this sense, we cannot adopt this truth or incorporate it within us we can only be in relation to it. Lesson four. This experience gave me a real sense of what otherness means. For a time, I was the other of my town, the weird, the different, the suspicious. Through this experience, I gained a deep empathy for the others of our culture, the different, the weird, the suspicious. Indeed, it may surprise you, but the other is my current status in this institution as a non-LDS faculty. Most students understand my religious status as a kind of a negative. I am a non, as in non-LDS, 
rather than something positive. I am not what they are, which leaves them both curious, which I think is kind of cool, right? It's, it's a nice place to be, but also suspicious, not so nice to be. Indeed, I'm frequently hit with remarks like, how can you be non-LDS when you're so smart and so spiritual? <laughs> there is so much we could discuss about this issue of otherness, but suffice it to say for this presentation that the lack of civility in our government, I believe, evidences our general societal difficulties in knowing how to relate to the other of our lives. Lesson five, as carefully rational as I truly wanted to be at this formative stage in my life, I began to recognize how easily we can use rationality to argue ourselves into a corner, especially when reacting to certain community pressures. I now see that my atheism was my arguing myself into a corner, making false assumptions and extending them to absurdity in a perfectly rational manner. This recognition has led me to point continually in my academic career to the problematic assumptions we make, whether clients in my clinical practice or students and colleagues in our mutual pursuit of knowledge. I believe we need to acknowledge humbly that logic only begins once assumptions are in place. And if this is true, then all assumptions all starting points in our rationality, whether scientific or religious, are based on a kind of faith. This kind of realization would go a long way to leveling the playing field between religion and science. My final lesson from this experience. Conversion can come from any corner. When I tell people that the study of philosophy helped me turn the corner toward Christianity, they're usually startled. Philosophy, unfortunately, is often associated with non-religious pursuits. Yet I believe that any sincere truth-seeking can yield the truth. I heard the truth in philosophy because God helped me to have ears to hear it. In other words, I was open to hearing the truth, thank God. The trick, I think, for us as faculty members is cultivating these ears in our students so that they can hear the truth in whatever they're studying, including the study of atheistic literature. A crucial question for me in this regard is, how do we cultivate openness to the truth without being so open that our brains fall out? Openness is great, but it's dangerous without some kind of practical wisdom, what Aristotle called phronesis, to sort through the mound of information coming our direction. This question seems to me to be one of the great issues of education, especially religious education. The second experience I want to describe to you in my faith journey concerned one of my first clients as a clinical psychologist in training. At this point in the first year of my graduate training at Purdue University, I was a newly minted Christian with only a rudimentary sense of theological issues at play. I viewed my chosen field as potentially part of my mission, helping and healing the mentally disordered. However, the more secular aspects of my discipline struck me immediately. My professors talked a lot about human relations, including love, care, ethics, but they claimed to draw none of their insights from Christianity or any religion for that matter. Indeed, re religion was generally viewed derisively or as, at best, a crutch for the weak. I still remember one of my supervisors laughing at a video of me working with one of my clients. The client was a good Christian woman from Indiana who honestly felt that her unhappiness stemmed from her spiritual struggles. My supervisor was perfectly clear, as he put it, Help her get out of that religious claptrap. He says, she goes on, her sadness has nothing to do with God. It has solely to do with her lack of reinforcements or pleasures in her life. Now, as a doctoral student who was anxious to please, I'm ashamed to say, 
I carried my supervisor's message back to this Christian woman. In fact, I was so good at selling this message that she eventually learned not to think of her happiness in relation to God at all. She learned to think of herself and her relationships as though God had nothing to do with her emotions and the relevant events of her life. After all, I recall her saying, what you're saying, Brent, has to be right because science has proven it. When my client and I were finished, she no longer saw God as the source of her emotional healing. She no longer considered even the possibility that her spiritual struggles could be intertwined with her emotional struggles. At least for this part of her life, she was a Christian atheist, a Christian in other aspects of her life, but an atheist in her understanding of her emotions. I do think, however, that if she had continued her therapy with me and my supervisor, I would have persuaded her little by little, one problem after another, to understand every part of her life as though God didn't matter. I drew five major lessons from this experience that have since guided a large portion of my academic research. My first lesson from this experience was the power of secular explanation. These explanations were not neutral or unbiased. I've been taught that secular this, this secular discipline was somehow less biased and less value laden. But it was through this experience I realized the so-called secular explanations were filled with biases and values of their own. In the case of my supervisor, they were filled with all sorts of assumptions about the importance of pleasure and pain for humans. My supervisor, as I realized later, had a hedonistic view of human nature, with humans as pleasure-seeking creatures who are solely concerned with their benefits. From this perspective, depression is, an, is the inevitable and invariable result of inadequate pleasures and benefits. Yet these assumptions and the values that accompany them are highly, highly debatable. I won't debate them here. Lesson two, I also learned how investigator bias can masquerade as scientific objectivity. My supervisor frequently claimed that scientific research had proven his assumptions and values, but I learned later that all the studies he would cite as support could be interpreted in many, many other ways. In other words, I learned how easily psychological scientists can understand or underestimate their own biases in interpreting their research. The behavioral research my supervisor would have cited did not have to be viewed as conflicting with my client's Christianity, what he called her religious claptrap. Yet his authority, under the banner of scientific objectivity, allowed him a unique power, not only over me, but also over the clients I influenced. My lesson here was to be very careful about this power of authority. Also, that scientists and therapists are no less biased than anyone else. Lesson three, the exclusion of God does not make the explanation of a professional practice, explanation or the professional practice less biased. In other words, leaving God out of a discipline does not mean greater objectivity. In other words, uh, this assumption is common to many secularists, but I learned that leaving God out merely leaves a hole in the explanation that is filled in with other factors, such as my supervisor's hedonism. In the case of my Indiana client, her trust in my secular theories and therapies allowed me to undo her belief about the importance of God for her emotions. And had I continued with her in therapy, I would have systematically dismantled nearly all her Christian beliefs. She might have retained her intellectual belief in God, but practically speaking, she would have been an atheist. Lesson four, the secularism of all our disciplines may be providing similar godless explanations to our students. Could the faculty of this university unknowingly be teaching students how to explain their world in a way in which God isn't a difference maker within that world? 
Jeff Reber and I wanted to test this hypothesis uh, in psychology. We wondered whether psychologists subtly persuade even religiously minded students to move away from their beliefs. For example, students who considered God to be necessary to their happiness when they first came to college might tend to exclude God in their analysis of happiness after their education in psychology. We wondered about that. In other words, psychological explanations of happiness would have been replaced by, um, or would have replaced religious explanations. This hypothesis led us to conduct an investigation with BYU psychology students. I see many of them in here, actually. Not the ones who were tested, but you guys know who I'm thinking about. Our findings were quite strong, that the more psychological education these students received, the more they turned towards secular and psychological explanations that did not involve God. Much like my Indiana client, this, these students retained a strong intellectual belief in God. If you'd asked them, they would have told you they're Christian. But God was considered less in their everyday thinking about themselves, their emotions, and their relationships. Lesson five. We need a counterbalance, I believe, to the dominance of the secular in our disciplines. I know this goes against our modernist mindset, our enlightenment mindset, but could a Christian voice be viewed as a viable school of thought, much as humanism or behaviorism are considered schools of thought in psychology? I asked this question of myself after my Indiana client. As a therapist who believes in the, currents, the current difference-making of God, what could I have done differently with my Indiana client? First, I could have affirmed her spiritual life, not talked her out of it as I did. This affirmation would have meant that my questions and our discussions would have been vastly different. Did her spiritual struggles indicate a broken relationship with God? If God truly exists, and he truly cares, then our relationship with him is pivotal to our emotional health. Depression often stems from broken relationships. Had she experienced spiritual promptings that indicated a need to reconcile with someone? Did she need to forgive someone? As a second difference with my Indiana client, I could have recommended to her and facilitated all the considerable resources of Christianity, prayer, scriptures, spiritual promptings, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the unique love of her Christian community. We could talk about that uniqueness, because I think that there's a special love in Christian communities. Religious people consistently report being comforted and even healed with these resources, and third, my client would not have been the only one to have used these Christian resources. Prayer, God's word, spiritual promptings, the Christian community would also have been available to support me as her therapist. Indeed, I believe that any real insight that I have ever had into a client's problem has ultimately originated from the divine, either from spiritual promptings or scriptural teachings or the love of my fellow Christians. Now, as I conclude, I realize that some of you may hear these three aspects of Christian therapy and want to point to distinctions between religion and science, or between pastoral counseling and psychological counseling. But aren't these distinctions primarily human-made conventions? Some of the greatest discoveries and creations of the modern world have occurred because disciplinary lines were crossed. And what if, just for the sake of argument, we were primarily interested in counseling effectiveness? If Christianity is the truth, wouldn't the most effective counseling take this Christianity into account in delivering psychological care? Why maintain the historical boundaries when the truth means crossing them? I also fear that if we maintain these historical boundaries, we rob our students of what I most needed in, in my hillbilly town, the thinking side of Christianity. 
I fear our students will learn to compartmentalize their faith with their disciplines in the secular compartment and their faith in the religious compartment. Christianity isn't just belief. There are darn good rational and empirical reasons for our faith. Yet if we teach implicitly or, or, in, or explicitly that Christianity really makes no difference in our disciplines, much as I taught my Indiana client that God made no difference in her emotions, we're not only telling our students that God is irrelevant to our disciplines, we are also disempowering our faith. Thank you. You know, I think um, um, it's a great place. And I feel uh, blessed to be here. I, I have a, a strong sense of mission here. And this is, a place, uh, this is a place, to be very frank with you, that has encouraged me to interface the sacred and the secular, like the kind of thing I'm talking about here. So the thing I yearned for, and I, I will tell you, I came from Baylor University. Uh, I was there as a director of clinical training for, for a decade. And that's the, much like this is the flagship of the, of the LDS Church, that's the flagship of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and I will tell you that there, at least in the psychology department, it, it wasn't welcomed. I mean, the, the interfacing of the sacred and the secular. We, we had a certain kind of a philosophy that basically said, we can be very loving to them, but we don't ever mention God or Jesus Christ or anybody like that in class. That would be a major faux pas. So it didn't feel welcomed there to me, the kind of stuff I wanted to do. And here it was encouraged. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have great advice. Um, I'm not much of an advice giver, um, but I, I'm hoping that, that uh, we here as faculty, maybe even uh, humbly this presentation, would at least alert them to those kinds of pressures, those kinds of forces that are out there. Because I think if you can anticipate um, what you're going to get, it helps take the power out of it. And I think that if you can be forearmed that what they're presenting as objectivity ain't necessarily so, I think that that can help students a great deal. Um, I would encourage them, of course, to seek out resources perhaps other than um, the resources at the universities. Um, it might just be that there are um, very concerned Christian or religious faculty who are struggling with those same kinds of issues. And so if they could, if they could find that person perhaps as a mentor or at least have someone that, as a resource, um, that might help them a great deal. Uh, well, I, I, do a lot of, uh, I do a lot of sort of uh, philosophy of s science, and uh, I look at the assumptions. This, this is more boring than you ever could imagine, probably. But, you know, I, th I think it's been fascinating for me to just explore the possibility. Uh, Jeff Reber and I uh, try to collaborate on this uh, portion of our research. But I think it's fascinating just to kind of consider what would a, a theistic, what would a... a what would a psychology be like if God mattered? And so I have pursued that um, in, in several ways, some of which I, I alluded to, but um, I'm really interested, I think, what, what, what I found out, I've pr done several presentations now along these lines at, like at American Psych Association, which is a peculiarly, um, singularly uh, unreligious, I would say. Um, and they are somewhat shocked and appalled, but um, I think we find also some people that are willing to come alongside and, and to help. Um, but I, I don't know that I could do that at APA if I didn't have a base that allowed me to do that and encouraged it.
I think that's a great question. And I think um, it, any clinician would have to ask him or herself that, any therapist or counselor. And I, I would tell you, I guess, that I, I couldn't deny my Christianity. I think, so one key issue is informed consent. Do you know what you're getting? You know, here are some of the assumptions and biases I would have. I, I, I would hesitate, I would hasten to add that almost no one does that. In other words, har hardly any, any uh, atheistic therapist would tell the Christian that's sitting in front of them their biases because they would think of their atheism as more objective, right, if that makes sense. But I think I would have a duty to do that. And then I think that if they still consented to be with me, I would, I would still call on, I think, inspiration in my work so that God was with me and so forth. Um, but I probably wouldn't use a lot of, of Christian rhetoric. I probably would use and, and revert to a language that they were comfortable with. I would want, I think, to have a good relationship with them. And so for me to use my language in spite of their language doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't seem very loving to me. So to me, I would, I would push aside the Christian rhetoric. I, I will tell you, though, when I am working with express Christians, Christians who expressly are, explicitly are Christian, I feel like I've got a whole other set of tools because now I've got a common moral language, at least, you know, especially as a marital therapist. Oh, I completely agree with that. I hope my passion came through in my presentation. Yeah, because I'm, I'm not objective about this. So I, I, my bias on biases is that we all have them. And we might as well fess up. And that includes scientists, that in, in, even when they're doing their research. Ask you, if my, several of my students are here, if, is, is that my bias on biases? <laughs> He's, he's, referring to the, uh, he's referring to my remark about how easy it is to argue ourselves into a corner. I think, and I think we could throw in with that how easy it is to, in some sense, start with assumptions maybe that we're not even aware of and reason from those you know, to the implications that might be problematic. Uh, my experience with a lot of students um, is that once students understand the assumptions they're making, a lot of times they don't agree with them. So part of my job, I think, then, is to unearth, to help them to self-discover those assumptions so that they can, they can reason, I think, more consistently with their own moral perspective. Does that get added a little bit? And more critically, yeah, that's right, yeah. As you know, I teach a class on critical thinking about this stuff, so. As you know, unfortunately, I probably should say. <laughs> The question being raised is, um, if I'm advocating a theistic psychology, and I'm somewhat known for doing that in, in my discipline, um, doesn't that open up a can of worms? Um, doesn't that mean that, why, why wouldn't I consider a polytheism? Uh, why couldn't, here's another issue, why couldn't I consider an impersonal God? Right, because I think most of us here are thinking about God in particular ways, and there's a whole bunch of other ways, as you know, with your work on the Hmong. Right, I mean, there's a lot of other approaches. I would just love to open up that conversation, Jacob. I mean, I I would be willing. Yeah. So I think the other part of your question is, doesn't that doesn't that dissolve into some multiplicity of anything goes? into a kind of a relativism, and I don't, I don't think it necessarily has to, but I, I, would, I would go the other direction. I think what's happened in my discipline, you can speak for yours, what's happened in my discipline is it's dissolved already into a multiplicity of anything goes, right? I mean, there's all sorts of schools of thought, and, and even the notion of naturalism, which is what I would probably contrast with theism, that is, this, this notion that God isn't involved in some sense, whether it's reductive naturalism, and I would even, this is maybe more controversial, methodological naturalism, where God isn't involved in our methods, right? 
Um, I think there's a multiplicity of naturalisms. I see them any time I see a, a writing, right, in psychology. So it's an unacknowledged multiplicity, I would say is more dangerous than an acknowledged multiplicity. But, so the question I think is, uh, if you have, if you open this up, where does it end at some level? And I mean, I think um, if, if what we're studying is already in some sense godless, why would we continue to study what's wrong from our perspective just because it doesn't open it up? That makes sense? So I'd like to open it up to the possibility of truth, right, and allow that multiplicity. Yeah, so I, in other words, I, I don't think we should artificially constrain it, especially when we're not even allowing in the voices that we hold most near and dear. So, yeah, are there problems with that? Of course, but I think we deal with those as we go. Yeah, no question, at least for me. I don't think that's for everybody. I think there are very sincere believers and relators to Christ, if we want to think about it that way, who don't need to go through atheism and shouldn't, right? But for me, it was very strengthening. It's going to be very difficult to talk me out of Christianity because I've already flirted with the alternatives, if that makes sense, have a good sense of sort of the dead end that gets you. I don't know about that. Now, I, I have a good friend, as Karen knows, um, my wife knows, that um, he is a Communist Party member in China, and he, is, he has his uh, hands on the funding for virtually all of the research going on on this interface of sacred and secular. Um, and I was scared to death of this guy. I was supposed to be his mentor, and I could go into that, but I was supposed to be his mentor, and he's a very imposing guy, okay? In fact, of the mentors, there were five of us going to China. Of the mentors, we were like, I'm not going to take him. You're going to take him? But I, I want to say that because, um, because as scared as I was of him, now when I greet him, as, as Karen knows, we're just as affectionate as, as I've ever been with any man in my life, okay? And, and from my upbringing, you don't get that affectionate, okay? But um, this, this man who is, who is an avowed atheist has more than once said about the mentors, not just me, he sees the love of God in us. I mean, it's very striking. He's very, very open about... His, he's open to those kinds of experiences. And more than once he said, there's something to what you're talking about, you know. Well, it is, I guess, a little bit. I mean, Lewis was one who, through several uh, people that we know, like Tolkien and others, uh, Lewis was someone who came to faith, I think, somewhat intellectually. And he's one who would say that he had to rediscover the emotional part of it as well, in a, in a way. Yeah, Lewis is a, is a favorite of mine, as you know. Um, and I've written a great deal. In fact, I'm in, a, I'm in a, the LDS perspective on C.S. Lewis as a, as a non-LDS. I have a chapter in there right next to a general authority. So I think that makes me a sub-general authority. <laughs> um, but no, I, um, I love Lewis. I see a lot of inspiration. That guy was something else. He really, really was. And I do, I do identify with him. I, I wish I identified with him more because I think he's a much, uh, a much stronger sense of Christianity than, than I have. I mean, I just, I see all kinds of just his... Uh, ministry to his brother and, you know, the way he understood his wife and all kinds of things, I mean. Very impressive. So thank you for the connection.
Yeah, that's, that's going to take a long time probably. Let me outline it a little bit, see if this will be somewhat satisfying. Um, a favorite theologian of mine, Alf, Alvin Plantinga, this is a guy at Notre Dame, would say that the, he would, I thought this was interesting, he would say the Christianity is the rough intersection among the various creeds, like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, and therefore the conferences that led to those creeds. In other words, God working through history. And my understanding is that at least many LDS would probably not endorse that understanding of what orthodoxy is in Christianity. Okay. Um, but I do know of many LDS and more traditional, we might say, uh, Protestant Christians like myself, pagan Gentiles as I've you know, <laughs> referred to myself. Um, I do think that uh, we can have and should have one of the, the primary issues probably less about beliefs in my view. Now, this is probably controversial. It's more about relationship. So am I in relationship to this guy who is alive and is working through the Holy Ghost or Spirit to help me, to prompt me, to care about me? Does he love me? Can I wrap my mind around the, the I am beloved by him? And I think that's another way of talking about Christianity where I'm not sure there'd be that much difference. It depends. I think theology makes a difference, right? But, um, and so I think a, a bad theology can lead you astray. So there would probably be some differences just in the theological issues, but if we're all tied to this guy, Jesus Christ, man, that, I think that ties us together in a unity that's pretty cool. I don't know uh, if I can do that in a short answer, but I'd certainly be willing to send you some articles. Um, one of the things that I would probably look to immediately, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the tradition of the patristics. So this is the, uh, you know, the church fathers, early church fathers. Um, they, they are famous, really, for considering almost all of the issues that psychologists are now considering with, I think, deep insight, okay? So mind-body relationships, um, what is healing? You know, how is God involved in healing? All of those kinds of questions are dealt with by various of the church, early church fathers in ways that I think are incredibly profound and dramatically different from most of the, most of the trajectories of most psychologists. And I think those have all sorts of implications for clinical work. Thank you.